Thanks for having me here as your guest today and for accommodating me uh, to be able to present from Vancouver. Thanks to Jesse for reaching out and for making, and to he, him and to the, the rest of the board members for making today's event possible. I'm joining you today from the traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and the Tsleil-Waututh First Nations, where I'm grateful to live and work. I'm gonna bring out my screen here. There we go. Okay. Uh, as Jesse mentioned, this exhibit is a partnership uh, between the Bill Reed Gallery and the Jewish Museum and Archives of BC. Um, it's currently on at the Bill Reed Gallery in downtown Vancouver. And uh, I'm gonna share with you today some of the, the process of its creation and the thinking that went into it, uh, which you will hear uh, was a long multi-year process. Um, so here we go. It's my pleasure today to speak to you about Keeping the Song Alive, an exhibit developed, as I say, in collaboration between the two museums. Um, I'm gonna share with you an overview of some of the people featured in the exhibit and a look at the process behind its development. I was at the Jewish Museum and Archives of BC, the JMABC, from 2013 to uh, 2022. And during that time, I had the privilege to curate and produce many meaningful programs showcasing the history of the Jewish communities of British Columbia. This included exhibits, walking tours, podcasts, a short film, and much more. A fundamental tenet of my work was to always seek opportunities to collaborate with both Jewish and non-Jewish organizations. For instance, the dinner series we pioneered in 2017, the Chosen Food Supper Club, lives on under the stewardship of Jewish Family Services. This program celebrated uh, the many diaspora communities that make up the Jewish community and uh, explored their roots and, and how traditions are kept alive through food. In 2019, we partnered with over a dozen organizations representing diverse communities to present the Cross-Cultural Strathcona Walking Tours, a series that continues and it has expanded every year since to incorporate even additional, uh, even more communities. Keeping the Song Alive was the final project I produced for the JMABC, and it's one of the most rewarding projects I had the opportunity to be involved with. The project evolved over its five years of development and provided the opportunity to collaborate closely with the Bill Reed Gallery, specifically with curators Beth Carter, who I saw is on the call today, and Cheryl Wadhams, and came to involve over a dozen Kwakwakwak artists and community members. There we are. That's Beth with the scarf, that's me in the middle, and, and Cheryl in the foreground. That's uh, during our trip up to Alert Bay, which I'm going to tell you a bit more about. Keeping the Song Alive centers on a collaborative effort by an earlier generation to preserve Kwakwakwak traditions and the threads of cultural flourishing that have followed in the wake of that encounter. The exhibit, as I said, is on display at the Bill Reed Gallery in downtown Vancouver until the end of March. I encourage you to go check it out in person. And I have to say, it feels especially appropriate to be delivering this talk today, just one day after the announcement of a $2.8 billion settlement in the Godfrey case, a step in the right direction. Now, three people are central to this historic story. Uh, Chief Billy Asu in the center here, Chief Mungo Martin on the left, uh, fixing up the totem pole and Ida Halpern there on the right with her uh, recording uh, device. Chief Billy Sue was born in 1867. As a child, he was identified by his elders as having the qualities of a future leader and was trained in the traditional ways, given special instruction in the nation's history, songs and all aspects of the potlatch. With the passing of his uncle, Chief Waimash, in 1891, Billy inherited the chieftainship at the young age of 24. Immediately, he embarked on what is widely regarded as a very progressive regime, negotiating for the construction of a local school so that the children 
would not be sent away. He went on to guide his village into temperance and advocated for better opportunities for his people, including fair wages at the local cannery and less restrictions on fishing. He led the community into the formation of a logging company, which harvested sections of timber within their territory. As a result of these efforts, uh, Cape Mudge became the first uh, village with individual modern homes, electricity, and running water. Chief Asu was known for the many potlatches he gave, including one with 3,000 guests, lasting over three weeks, where he gifted 6,000 blankets, two dozen canoes, and 100 gold and 200 silver bracelets. His name, Pasala, meaning to give many pot potlatches, was granted to him. In 1922, he was charged with violating the potlatch ban and 108 pieces of his regalia were seized. Chief Mungo Martin, or Nakapankam, meaning a potlatch chief 10 times over, was a highly recognized Kokwakua carver, painter, singer, songwriter, and teacher. Born in Fort Rupert in 1879, he was an authority on Kokwakua culture and traditions. As a little boy, it said Mungo was placed in a box drum by an uncle who was a very good singer and song maker. The box was beaten softly to a traditional song. And later his maternal grandmother sang him many songs. Martin apprenticed as a carver to a paternal uncle. He was also able to work with his stepfather, Charlie James. He went on to carve many poles, standing in Alert Bay, Victoria, Vancouver, the UK, and many other places. From 1848 to 1950, sorry, from 1948 to 1952, UBC invited Martin to take over their totem pole restoration program from his niece, Ellen Neal, the granddaughter of Charlie James. During this time, Martin and his wife, Abaya, befriended Ida Halperin. We saw the three of them in the introductory slide that was circulating. They often visited uh, Halperin's home and recorded 124 songs. Mungo also did additional recordings for UBC. In 1952, he moved to Victoria to a replication program for old poles. One of his greatest accomplishments was the creation of Wavuatila, a small replica of Bukutsi, big house in Saxis for Rupert. The Wawadila opening ceremonies in 1953 also marked the first public potlatch since the government's ban of potlatch celebrations in 1885. And Ida Halperin here on the right was raised in Vienna. Ida Halperin, née Rudorfer, showed an early passion for music. Uh, in fact, she had ambitions to be a professional pianist. Um, an injury led her to pursue musicology instead at the University of Vienna at a time when the school was experiencing an intellectual flourishing in the field. When the Nazis annexed Austria in 1938, Ida and her husband, George, were among the thousands of Jews who fled. They went first to Shanghai and then later on to Vancouver in 1939. With her vast musical knowledge, Ida became an important figure in the classical music scene here. She taught music and music. She taught piano and music appreciation. Was founding president of the Vancouver Friends of Chamber Music Society, host of a show on CBC Radio, and a music critic for the Vancouver Province. She taught the first classes of music appreciation and musicology offered at UBC. In 1947, after years of building trust. Ida was invited by Chief Bill Yasu to visit his home in Cape Mudge. Over 10 days, they recorded 88 traditional songs, complete with contextual explanations. She later described it as the most exciting time of my life. While Chief Mungo Martin was working at UBC in 1951, he and Abaya, his wife, became close friends with the Halperins, and Mungo and Ida recorded 124 songs. I have here a uh, interview, I believe from CBC, uh, from 1965, in which Dr. Halpern recounts how these recordings began. 
I'm just going to jump over to that. Chief Billy Asu was one of the greatest chiefs at uh, the recent times of the Kwakutl tribe. And he had uh, three sons, handsome sons, educated sons, clever sons. And he was a songmaker himself, Chief Billy Asu. But the sons, none of them was interested in the folklore. No, nobody was interested to sing the songs of his father. And as I asked him, said, now, Chief Billy, what happened if you die? And he got very grave and very sad. Music dies with me. So I said, no, you see, that's what I want. I want to keep your culture. I want to keep your songs for generations to come. They are beautiful. And if you would cooperate and so on. And as he realized it, he was quite excited about the project. He said, good, good, good. You come and stay with us. So he invited me and I went to Cape March the Indian Reserve, and I stayed with him and his wife for 10 days. And he was eager to come and think, 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 you know, and he gave me 86 songs at that time. Um, he said, boastingly, you know, Indians like to boast. Uh, I know 100 songs, and of course I thought I didn't believe it, because uh, if we check ourselves, who is able to think of 100 songs like that? Not many, really, don't we? And here he was just marvelous, going on and on and on. And if I could have stayed longer than 10 days, I think he would have made the 100 mark. So that, uh, that was the question, you see, that's why I came to the Quackutals, because they were the most interesting uh, people and their music was not known. Um. So in time, um, Ida Halperin made over 300 recordings, many of which were released by Smithsonian Folkways between 1967 and 1986. Each of the four two-disc sets contained an essay by Dr. Halperin contextualizing the recordings. These are just, these are the two first recordings. There are two subsequent ones. And each of these is a, a double disc record set. Uh, one of the important innovations that Dr. Halpern brought to her analysis was the argument that syllables previously thought by ethnographers and anthropologists to be meaningless did indeed contain meaning. Through her conversations with the singer, she was able to make the case that some of these syllables were onomatopoeic, representing the sounds of animals, while others were choreographic cues. She also observed that the rhythms of the songs did not fit neatly into the structures of European music, but were in fact much more complicated. And towards the end of the, her career, she was able to make use of sonographic analysis to illustrate just how complex these rhythms are. In 1984, Ida Halpern donated her recordings and papers to the Beast of Archives. She passed away three years later in 1987. Uh, in 2017, these recorded were submitted by the BC Archives for consideration for inscription in the UNESCO Memory of the World Registry. This submission by the BC Archives, as Jesse said, in 2017 was the catalyst for this exhibit. In late 2017, the BC Museums Association annual conference was held in Victoria. There, I had the opportunity to meet members of the BC Archives team, including uh, I believe Genevieve Weber is uh, on the call today. Hi, Jen. Uh, who are also in attendance uh, and happy to share the news of this recent submission. So this was the first time I'd, I'd heard the name Ida Halprin. I soon learned that she was Jewish and felt this would be a compelling story for the Jewish Museum to participate in telling. Understanding the centrality of Indigenous culture to Dr. Halpin's work, it felt wrong for us to tell the story alone. So it was wonderful news when Beth Carter of the Bill Reed Gallery offered to collaborate on the project and to engage Cheryl Wadhams as guest curator. Each of us brought complementary abilities to the project. Cheryl's kwakwakwak and familiar in the traditional ways and community dynamics. Beth is a highly experienced curator with particular experience in developing exhibits that deeply engage the community in a process of creation. I have similar, although 
admittedly less experience uh, developing community engaged projects and a deep understanding of Jewish history. So as the three of us embarked on our work, a question guiding our efforts was wanting to understand how Kokakua culture had survived decades of efforts by the Canadian government to extinguish it through the potlatch and the residential school system. We wanted to hear from members of the community who were heirs to Billy Asu and Mungo Martin to understand the importance of the traditional ways to them, to learn how the culture was being practiced today and to ask their blessing to tell this story. Kokwakua territory spans the northeast corner of Vancouver Island. It's illustrated here in the yellow. Um, a significant portion of the mainland opposite and the many islands of the strait. We knew we wanted to visit communities and individuals in Alert Bay, um, Port Hardy, Fort Rupert, Campbell River, Mudge Island, and Victoria. In early 2020, we were fortunate to receive a grant from the BC Arts Council, making it possible for, to visit these communities. Now, I'm sure it will come as no surprise to anyone uh, that those plans had to be postponed due to unforeseen world events. So in November 2021, we were finally able to make our first trip to Victoria to visit the BC archives, to see the Halperin collection in person, meet with some key collaborators. Over subsequent months, we held interviews with contributing artists. Some were held in person here in Vancouver, but many occurred online with folks living here and throughout the region. The following summer uh, of 2022, we drove up Vancouver Island to visit community members in Nimble River, Fort Hardy, Fort Rupert, and Um Huge thank you to everyone who welcomed us on these trips and spoke with us. It, made this whole thing possible and also uh, a big thank you to uh, the bc arts council for not only for their support but for their understanding in putting letting us leave the funding on a shelf until it was possible to use it for our conversations with community members we learned that it was not so much a coordinated effort, but rather a thousand isolated actions, large and small, that allowed the culture to persist. The metaphor of a blanket kept coming up, so much so that the button, the button blanket became the primary design motif for the final exhibit. Button blankets are, of course, an essential component of Kokakua culture, linking family and history. As a metaphor, a blanket also helps us to see how culture persisted during the oppressive measures of the Canadian government, including the potlatch ban and the residential school system. Each of these actions were threads that made it possible to restitch the blanket of culture, despite all actions, all attempts to unravel it. The recordings Dr. Halpern made were but one of these threads, important indeed, but not isolated. Uh, there we are on our trip with uh, Chief David Knox. So as Andy Everson, one of the artists featured in the exhibit tells us, people like his grandparents found ways around the ban, ways to practice their traditions and pass on their culture in secret. Uh, this is a statement that accompanies his piece, Concealment, uh, that's on display in the exhibit. So I'm just gonna read that. He writes, during the potlatch ban, many families risked imprisonment to continue our sacred ceremony, ceremonials. In isolated communities, they waited until the weather got bad before they would begin their potlatches. In this way, they knew that it would be difficult for the Indian agent and the RCMP to get to the village and arrest the participants. In communities that were surrounded by a non-Indigenous population, however, this tactic could not work. Here, our people would condense and conceal our ceremonies and invite their guests under the guise of socially acceptable Canadian institutions, such as the Tea Party. In the 1930s and 40s, my grandparents, Chief Andy Negedzi and Margaret Umagalis Frank, did just such a thing. They would invite people over to discuss ceremonial prerogatives and give out names to their family members 
which were sometimes recorded in ledger books. Because they had invited their guests as witnesses, they would distribute gifts and disperse money to them. After the anti-potlatch law was dropped for the Indian Act, my father, my grandfather bought a reel-to-reel -reel recorder and started recording these sessions, which are used as reference to this day. I honor his foresight by including his actual recorder in this piece. You can see it there. Concealed under the table is a design that represents the Hamatsa dances in my grandparents' box of treasures. It is this particular dance and this imagery of cannibalism that frightened the Canadian government and contributed to the creation of the potlatch band. Painted with the traditional use of graphite in the paint and mica flakes to reflect firelight, this piece harkens back to an early aesthetic. Like a sacred dance screen, a lamelas, it can be raised and lowered and concealed from view. To the casual observer, it may look like a typical tea party, but for our people, it was a critical way to keep our culture alive under the oppressive watch of the Canadian government. Uh, so that's the end of the statement. So this is, uh, you can see the table uh, tilts up there. The teacup is teetering on it. And if we were to turn around and see it from the other side, you'd see that this is what is underneath which is what he was just describing. So this was something that we heard again and again from many people we spoke to in preparation for the Pacific. Strategies including building potlatches on remote islands, disguising them as Christmas or Thanksgiving gatherings, separating the ceremony from the business. It's, uh, what Andy was referring to is passing on of names or, or other um, uh, important business. Uh, Maxine Maddelpi is another artist we spoke to who uh, contributed to the exhibit. She's a skilled artist of button blankets, aprons, and regalia, and we feature one of her blankets in the exhibit. My colleagues had an informative interview with her in May. Uh, in this clip, she spoke to the often uncredited role that women play in keeping the tradition alive. I started this study quite, uh, quite steady about... Uh... 34 years ago, and I, I always felt that the women's work behind the scenes were always forgotten, you know, were the backbone of our men. Mm -hmm. And what, whatever we do, you know, we whisper into the chief's um, ears what needs to be said. Also, um, regalia and song and dance and masks they go hand in hand, and that's really not so acknowledged until these last few years. One can't be without the other. When I was a child um, at Turner, my mother put her hands up in front of me like this, and I didn't understand at that time what five-year-old needs to hear this, but I did. You're not going to be a kid forever, and I'm going to say that in Kwakwala, East plus Hayus love. You know, that entails uh, her saying to me, your hands are always going to be busy. You're not going to be a kid forever. Your hands will always be making things. You know, one day you're going to be a wife and one day you're going to be a mother. So these will always be busy. And I looked at her like, whoa, what does that mean to me? <laughs> <laughs> like I said, five years old. Yeah, okay. I need to hear that. <laughs> it wasn't too long after this, between six and seven years old is when I, when she started bringing me elsewhere to, to um, start working on button blankets. And I, mean, I was the sorter of buttons. I was the threader. And then I did the cutting. So there's so many things that a woman entails besides giving birth and putting the regalia together. I think it's really important that, you know, we're acknowledged for what we do to make it, to keep it alive, right? Uh, during our trip to Alert Bay in June of last year, we had the privilege of meeting Pee Wee Alfred, who's on the left here, and Cody Nelson. 
uh, both live in Alert Bay and have been leaders there in ongoing efforts to teach the young generation the old ways. We have a clip from Cody as well. Um, we met Cody at the big house, which is where he's standing there, uh, where Andrea Cranmer hosts a weekly culture night. At these events, uh, children and teens learn songs and dances from their elders. Early on, Cody shared the story of how he first learned these songs and dances as a child in the 1970s. And I was uh, one of the fortunate ones to uh, have been enrolled in the Nimkish Nursery School in their probably the late 70s. And uh, at that time, it was a very confusing time for our people. Uh, my mother, Elizabeth Nelson, along with Nancy Vera, started the culture program at the Nimbis, the Nimkish Nursery School back then. And there was a lot of pushback from community wondering what the importance of teaching our culture to our children was. And uh, in those early days, there wasn't a budget for the culture program. It wasn't, uh, didn't really get established for a number of years. And I remember as a child getting ready to dance at school behind our dance screen and the record, the sound of the record would be the scratchy uh, needle on the record and the teachers would all tell us to be quiet. Shh, be quiet. And then the record would start and then a Hamacha song would come on. And for a number of years, that's how we learned our culture until uh, at what time they were successful in getting a budget to hire uh, an elder by the name of Jack Peters, shaped us uh, to come and be our singer for the culture program. But before then, we danced to Ida Halpern's uh, record that she had with Mungo and Billy Asu, and to this day, we still, uh, because the quality of the recordings were such where it was one-on-one, -on -one, mm -hmm. it was a lot easier to hear the words than it is from old uh, recordings of the same era at a potlatch setting, because right. there's so much more background noise to the potlatch yeah. recordings versus Ida's. So I probably may have danced with those records for a year or two. And then uh, that we called him Old Man Jack got hired. And this is a photo of uh, Jack Peters, who Cody was speaking about with, um, sorry, uh, <laughs> with Gloria Cranmer um, at the Umista Cultural Center, I believe at the opening of the Umista Cultural Center in 1980. In Campbell River, we visited Sonny Asu at his home studio. Sonny is the great-great-grandson of Chief Billy Asu, an award-winning contemporary artist in his own right. His work is no uh, noted for incorporating Coast Salish iconography into a contemporary context, often with a critical and humorous tone. Uh, a number of his works make reference, direct reference to his great-great-grandfather. Here is a piece that he did uh, that is actually featured in the exhibit. Um, and as you can see, it's alluding to a contemporary music festival, um, but featuring Billy and the Chiefs, banned by the Canadian government, uh, the strict law tour. Uh, so all these are, are their door prizes, including Hudson's Bay Company blankets. Um, so these various, uh, this text is, is alludes to the history uh, and specific um, references. Uh, like, 
like Cody, uh, Sonny spoke to the importance of the Folkways records. We just saw him holding one of them uh, to his identity and his work. We approached Sonny about lending one of his works to the exhibit, which he kindly did. In fact, two of his existing works, this work and Ellipsis. Uh, and he kindly did so and was so inspired that he went a step further and created a whole new work just for the exhibit uh, featuring Chief Billy Asu. So this is uh, a vinyl piece that is adhered directly to the wall in the mezzanine of the Billery Gallery. That's a photo of Chief Billy Asu. As you can see, you see just below him what looks like a record, record player. Um, and in the top corner there, you see the cave presents, which um, the famous venue, music venue that's once stood uh, on this on Hornby Street in what would have been directly across the street from uh, the Bill Reed Gallery. Um, and there are just below the cave, you see the iconography of the coppers, um, which is an important uh, component of Kwakwakwa and Coast Salish tradition. So as a final example, I'd like to mention Rory Dawson, who established the Urban Dance Group here in Vancouver in uh, 1993. It's provided a gathering place for Kwakwakwak living in and around the city, and for many was their first point of connection to the old ways. The following is compiled from the interview we held with him. So he said, I just want people to feel they belong, to feel connected to our ancestors being a part of a group and creating a safe space for composing songs, learning dances, and being close to culture and ceremonies. I remember as a child, it was more a more rounded version of culture, not just singing and dancing. There's this whole aspect of our worldview and our society. Everybody had a role to, and a place in our tribe, from chiefs to song composers. Residential school affected my parents negatively, so I carried a lot of trauma for many years and became lost in the concrete jungle of the city. One evening, I was listening to a mixtape of potlatch songs that someone gave me from a Mystic Cultural Center. A light bulb just went off, and I got motivated to learn the songs. That's when we started the Urban Dance Group. I didn't really hear so much singing as a child. I just really got into it from 93 on. One of our chiefs gave permission for the dance group to use his family's song, but when he passed away, the rights to the songs changed hands. So I just started composing songs for the group. I've composed at least 15 songs. After a while, you listen to a whole bunch of different songs and then the tunes come to you. There's a very supernatural spiritual aspect of learning, composing and understanding songs that connect us to our ancestors' worldview. A lot of songs are composed for a specific person. Christine paid, played a large part in supporting my family, so I gifted her with a song. I woke up in the morning before the feasting that day, and it just kind of came to me. It's Tsalkwala, a woman's dance, a lady's dance. When we got the feast songs from Ida Halpern's recording, that was really exciting. They gave thanks to the host for feeding the people. That recording really helped many people and brought a lot of life to that part of the ceremony. So as you can see, each of the people we met with shared a unique vantage point on these recordings and more broadly, the traditions and history of the Kwakwakwa. Many commented on how moving it was to hear these recordings. Sunny Asu told us how they provided him a bridge to connect him to his great-great-grandfather who passed away before he was born. Henry Seaweed and Maxine Matlapi, Matlapi, both elders in the community, each commented on the joy it brought them to hear the songs sung in the way they remember from their youth. The singers of today, they said, don't fully capture the intonation and complexities of the old masters. A second theme was the impact of residential schools on the potlatch ban, as you've heard. Beyond rupturing the community's ability to carry out its traditions, many interviewer, interviews hinted to or spoke directly to the trauma endured and the coping mechanisms these policies sparked, most prevalently addiction to drugs and alcohol. The third theme that appeared in almost every interview was the holistic nature of the traditions. Uh, we just heard Rory 
say just this. The songs, the history, the iconography, the regalia, the business, and the dances all go hand in hand. They're inseparable and support one another. These aspects are not confined to the potlatch, but the potlatch is their epicenter. So I'll wrap up with uh, just one image that sticks with me from our trip to Alert Bay that I just can't shake. So Alert Bay, which we're looking at here, um, there's a small crescent-shaped island. The ferry dock is at the center of the bay, and from there to the opposite coast is an invisible line bisecting the island into the white side and the Indian side. The story goes that the fish spilling out of the Nimkish River on Vancouver Island opposite into this bay were so plentiful 75, 100 years ago that you could walk on the backs across the strait, the backs of the fish, and never touch water. If you walk about 15 minutes north along the waterfront road, you arrive at the Umista Cultural Center, which since 1980 has been the home uh, for the items seized by the Canadian government at Dan Cranmer's 1921 potlatch, and a place dedicated to the learning and sharing of Kwakwaka culture. Its architecture echoes a longhouse, and totem poles stand outside, looking out to the sea, welcoming people, welcoming visitors. Beside the Umista Cultural Center sits a large grassy field surrounded by trees, about the size of a city block. This field is the former site of St. Michael's Residential School, constructed in 1929 and operated by the Anglican Church until its closure in 1975. After 75, the building remained as a ghost for another 40 years. Serving as a band office, a Kwakwakua run school, and even housing, and housing a restaurant and nightclub. In 2015, the building was finally torn down. The proximity of these two buildings startled me. St. Michael's an emblem of the suppression of indigenous culture and you missed a site of its healing and regeneration. Only five years separated the closure of the school from the opening of the museum. And for 35 years, they would have stood just a few paces apart from one another. So I realize it's no great insight to say that the legacy of residential schools and the potlatch ban will persist for many years, but it is rare that such historical contrasts are presented to us plain, so plainly in physical space. Uh, to conclude, I just want to express my gratitude to everyone who helped us to make this exhibit. There wasn't time to, today to include everyone's voices, but just know that each of them were essential. Particularly want to give thanks to the Asu family, and to Chief David Knox, heir to the name Mungo Martin and guardian of his legacy, who gave us permission to tell the stories of their ancestors and guided us in the appropriate use of their songs. Um, thank you very much. Happy to stick around for some questions. Thank you so much, Michael, and perhaps everyone can join me in a virtual round of applause for a very engaging talk. Um, as as I, we all know, we're living in a time of um, of heightened and overdue racial reckoning, and so it's really important to look back and consider these examples of um, intercultural collaboration. And I love not only that we have this uh, example in Ida Helpburn and Chiefs um, Billy Asu and Mungo Martin, but also in the way that this exhibit was developed between so many different partners that you talked about in your talk, Michael. So thank you for sharing both of these stories and thank you for the work on your exhibit. I'm hoping I can get off the island and come see it before it closes. Um, I'm going to hand uh, things over to Melissa. So begin thinking about questions and entering them into the chat. Over to you, Melissa. Thank you. And thank you so much, Michael, for that fantastic talk. A lot of great information and visuals in there. Um, as Q&A leader today, I'd like to take the opportunity to start with a question to get us rolling and let everybody stew a little bit in the chat. Um, I was wondering what if you ran into any unexpected challenges in creating this exhibit um, and what sort of came about from that, or if you have any particularly favorite parts of this exhibit that we should all go see. 
Um, well, the unexpected challenge, the biggest one was COVID. <laughs> we got this grant like days before uh, travel restrictions came down. I mean, were issued. And so we weren't able to make use of the funding and we were concerned that we would have to return it and not be able to do any of this and have to reapply. And so it was really amazing that um, we were able to, to work around that. Um, other challenges, it wasn't, it wasn't so much a challenge, but it was really engaging as it was an engaging process to that the, the exhibit kind of evolved from what we initially thought it was to what it became. And it had a really natural life over these years. And I think that the fact that we were able to take some time to piece it together and to speak with so many people um, and that they were so willing to speak with us and, you know, and um, were appreciative of, of, of this story being told um, was a really rewarding experience. Um, I had never been up to Alert Bay or to these other communities up island and they're stunning. I mean, they're beautiful, the people are beautiful. It's so rich in history, both good and bad. Um, and we felt very welcomed uh, by the community uh, and supported to tell this story. So that was a really marvelous experience. Um, yeah, and I just hope that more people come to the exhibit and, and learn about this. And, uh, you know, we've, we've been in talks with some other institutions uh, to send it traveling over the coming years. I hope that'll come together um, and give more people opportunities to, to see, uh, to learn this story. Yeah. That would be fantastic. We'd love to see this travel. We, I've also been seeing quite a few questions about the music. Um, can Whitley ask if we can hear any of the music or if maybe there's any links that we can put in the chat so people can hear some of it? Um, and also just asking about the preservation of the music, if you have any more insight into that, the preservation of the recordings. Yeah, so the recordings are at the BC archives and they take care of that stuff, but they, um, but a number of the recordings, the Folkways recordings, uh, Folkways has become a, a branch of the Smithsonian. I don't know how long ago, maybe a decade ago or something. Um, and so Smithsonian Folkways has uh, these recordings available for online. So you can go to the website and listen to them. Um, they are ironically like up on Spotify in various channels. So interesting. Uh, in fact, a number of people told us that you know that that's where they first heard them and that we um when we were having the opening reception uh co a, a whole group came down from alert bay and cody who we heard from gave some remarks and he said you know i would bet you that everyone you know in this room of this community has these recordings on their phone right now like and all of them like put up their hands that they all had that they just listen to these recordings like you know pop music so they're out there they're easy to to get um and i encourage you to you know check them out um it did become part of the issue uh in putting the exhibit together is we wanted to do so we wanted to make sure people could hear the recordings but in a way that's respectful um, and a number of the songs belong to specific families or individuals or are uh, written, designed for specific instances. Um, like the Hamatsa song is for, a, the Hamatsa song is for a specific uh, dance uh, during the potlatch. Um, only members of the Hamatsa tribe can be part of that, Hamatsa, Hamatsa society rather. Um, and so I guess Dr. Halpern and Mongo and Billy Asu weren't quite so careful about that or cognizant of it. 
in the recordings. I don't know what process led to the selection of which um, ones would be released in such a public forum. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that, you know, what from what we heard, if that were to happen today, it would be much more carefully done, um, much more guarded. So yeah, there's probably, there are some songs out there that shouldn't be out there, um, but they're there. You can listen to them and- <laughs> uh, They're on Spotify. <laughs> yeah, there are people probably listening to them right now. So what can be done, you know? Diana also asks if any of the songs have been transcribed um, into English or, you know, if, if there's any other languages or if they're even, this is more of my add on to the question, or if there even is a way to translate this music or, or uh, these songs. Uh, there are transcriptions. Um, there's something of translations. Uh, I see that Genevieve has her hand up. And she's probably uh, has something to add to the previous question um, and can probably speak to this one as well. Uh, so maybe we should invite her to jump in and join. Would love that. Jesse, do you think you can help me out with the muting and unmuting here? For those yes, who don't know, talk. Genevieve is uh, archivist at the BC Archives. She can introduce herself and she's been uh, the leader on this collection. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for this, Michael. And I don't want to take away from your time chatting, I, but I did thought it would be a good opportunity to add a few, uh, a few things. Um, I had noticed Lara had asked specifically about preservation. And just very quickly, um, we have uh, preserved all of the original recordings by, uh, we've made master digital copies, as well as um, access copies in digital format. We um, had previously had access copies uh, on cassette. Um, and the originals are for the most part in frozen storage. So they're being uh, properly cared for uh, so that they don't disintegrate and lose information over time. Um, and we make them accessible to, uh, to community members and, and folks that have the rights to the songs um, as much as possible. We've also been working with some of the uh, communities. Um, I wanted to just say in, in a, in response to the previous question, um, the, the question around uh, uh, folkways and the Smithsonian is, uh, is a tricky one. And as Michael pointed out, it's complicated and probably if it was done today, it would be done quite differently. They are available. I would advise everyone to, um, to be really uh, sensitive and cognizant of the cultural sensibilities and sensitivities in the recordings, if you do choose to listen to them. And be aware that although we have the privilege and ability to listen to them, it may not actually be our right to do so. So keep that in mind if you do choose to do that. We've been working with a number of the families of the singers for quite a few years. And the question of taking the songs down from the, Smith the Smithsonian um, site is um, has is one that's come up a number of times, and we and the Smithsonian is fully prepared to do whatever the families want to do once they come to that conclusion. Whether that's completely remove them or maybe um, make them available with a note to uh, explain ownership and to connect people to who they should be reaching out to if they want permission to use the songs. Uh, not, that hasn't happened yet, and there is also an understanding that they are widely available. I mean, you can find the records in secondhand shops, you can find them online and other sites. Um, but there is definitely a feeling within the communities that although it's nice to have them widely available, it's also something that they want to have much more control over. So it's an ongoing conversation. It's, it's not a, a fast um, decision to make, but it's something that is, has been happening. Uh, for quite a few years. I just saw that there was also another question about the value of the Canadian Memory of the World registration. Um, I can very quickly speak to that from our perspective and then I'll pass it back to you, Michael. Um, the Memory of the World registration, uh, the program is, um, uh, it's material that is inscribed on the Memory of the World register is recognized as having significance and importance uh, to either a national or international culture at large. Um, 
the idea, one of the ideas behind it is that once it's inscribed, it really is um, hopefully seen as something that has to be protected in a way that maybe it hadn't been before um, or maybe might not be in the future. So if something is potentially at risk, if we were concerned that um, there might be a chance that these records will be forgotten, then now UNESCO has eyes on it and they're going to add added pressure to the, um, to the country, the state in which the records are kept. That wasn't necessarily a concern when we were putting forward these records for inclusion on the memory of the World Register, but of course we can never guess what might happen in the future. So now this is something that an international audience is much more aware of um, and would be in theory concerned about if there was ever a question of them being damaged or um, destroyed in the future. And it also means that my institution where I work um, is sort of encouraged and maybe even forced to uh, put more um, funding and, and resources towards protecting these, these really important records and doing community engagement work on them because again, there's that kind of added visibility to them. So for us, that's what the impact is on them. I'm gonna hand it back to Michael. Thank you for a few minutes for me answering the, some questions. Thanks for jumping in. <laughs> Do you have anything to add, Michael, before we move on? And thank you again, Genevieve, for jumping in. That was a lot of really great info. Nothing to add. Genevieve is totally the expert on this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I know we how really, to put it together. She knows the collection better than anyone. We really do appreciate that because there's always questions about the collection and how it's housed and, and it's important. So very happy to have you here. We also have a question from Jesse, who's our board member and who introduced you earlier. Um, Jesse, do you want to elaborate on your question or would you like me to read it out? Uh, sure. Yeah, I'm just I'm just struck by the fact that um, Dr. Helpern and uh, the chiefs she worked with both experienced state based oppression in very different contexts. And so I'm curious if you have any thoughts about how, um, well, one, her Jewish background, um, but also her experiences uh, fleeing Austria might have shaped her career here in BC. And if that's something that she ever spoke about publicly. Um, that was certainly something that we were curious about. And from what we gather, uh, she and George, her husband, led a very secular life here in Vancouver um weren't particularly involved with the Jewish community um but I will say that that is not an uncommon reaction for that generation um particularly those coming from urban centers cosmopolitan urban centers like Vienna or Berlin um that where the families would likely have been uh reform or secular Jews for a number of generations. Um, and so it kind of um, fits into the pattern of uh, what would what would be said in Yiddish Shah still, which is kind of blend in, don't make too much of a fuss. Um, and so I don't know if if it's it's kind of impossible to say whether they felt anything was missing from their lives or if they just felt this was the better course of action for them. Um, we did hear from the folks we spoke to during our trip that that experience would have likely um, garnered her esteem in the eyes of, of Billy and Mungo right, that they would have looked to her and said, you know what we're talking about, you know what we're facing, what we're up against, um, and may have like made them more open to sharing their sacred traditions with her. Again, this is being said like how many, 75 years later by people who weren't there, who like don't really know, but kind of is, so it's hard to pin down and give a solid answer authoritatively, um, but there was a feeling there um, in in some of the statements of kind of um, compatibility, familiarity between these experiences. So, yeah, it's it's easy to like want to craft a narrative for history, 
based on our viewpoint of today and what we think is a nice story. Um, and it's, you know, it's really difficult to resist that temptation, right? Like when you're writing a book about it or preparing an exhibit about it or a documentary or something. So the best we can do is, you know, say people have said, but like, who really knows? Yeah. Does anybody have any other questions for Michael today? Not everybody all at once. No, I'm kidding. Okay. Ah, Genevieve, go for it. Sorry, I had to let Genevieve okay. unmute again. <laughs> Um, I, I, I had a question maybe, um, for, for Michael and the work that you did when you met with folks, um, what was the sense you got? I mean, you mentioned a little bit about, um, being not unsure about like what the agreement was in terms of like sharing with folkways and stuff, but what was the sense you got from community members about, um, Ida Halpern generally and her, I don't know what the word is that I'm looking for her, I guess her intentions and her like um, connection to the community. I mean, you've touched on it a bit. And the reason I ask is because I always find it so interesting that her donor agreement to the BC archives is so forward thinking in some ways, because she actually, when she donated the records, she is very explicit in the agreement that the records are going there um, specifically with the intention of, of making them, preserving them and making them accessible to the Indigenous communities first and foremost. Um, and that sort of all other reasons for keeping them are, are very much secondary considerations. So did that sort of thing come up and like that, that did anything come up about Ida's understanding of the community and, and their, their needs in this process? Um, it's a good question. It kind of ran the gamut. Uh, some people knew next to nothing about her. Um, others had been, had participated in efforts by the the archives. I believe Piotr is one of those folks who's you know gone with a group down to the archives and listened to recordings and corrected the transcriptions and you know um, gone through it. So I think that. There was an appreciation the recordings are there, that they're accessible. Um, there's a gratitude that they're, you know, preserved in the archives. Um, and, but I think that in terms of like why she did it, it's not really clear, you know. Um, one thing that that also came up in the research, I don't know how connected this is, but it kind of reminded me of it, what you're, what you're talking is like her outsider status, that for a long time, she wasn't accepted by uh, the ethnomusicology field, like in, at UBC and elsewhere, which was really a boys club, uh, the anthropologists, and they, you know, mocked her for as, as Haida Ida. Uh, that she drank the Kool-Aid and was, you know, talking like the Indians or whatever, you know. But like when you unpeel that prejudice, what is really being said is like she she listened to them. <laughs> she like asked them, "What does this mean? When do you sing it? Why?" Like all those, you know, layers, um, which allowed her to bring up more comprehensive analysis to like what the songs are about, what context they're used in, who they belong to. Um, what I spoke about earlier about the, um, the onomatopoeic sounds, the bird calls and the wolf cries and, you know, the different animal sounds in there and the choreographic stuff. So, I mean, it's so stupidly simple that if you just listen to people, you get a better answer. Like, um and it seems that like for a long time her predecessors like just looked down upon first nations with such like 
they couldn't understand that they would have something intelligent to say about their own tradition, right? Which is absurd. So I think that people saw that difference in her work in the essays that are, that are included in the songs, in the conversation. I mean, there are like fragments of conversations in the recordings um, that are like helpful to people that kind of give a better sense of her as a person and why, as and, and being like an honest partner in this work. And I think it also speaks to the, the character of uh, the integrity of, of Billy Sue and Mungo Martin as like highly regarded leaders who wouldn't have wasted their time with somebody who wasn't serious business and wasn't there with good intentions. Um, so I think that all those things together kind of uh, gave her you know, a position worthy of trust. Do you, what's, what's your sense? Have you, you've had a number of conversations with the communities. Does, does that align with your sense? Sorry, I keep muting myself and then I have to get permission. I mean, I think you summed that up really great. And I really like what you just said about um, Mungo Martin and Billy Asu being such important people and respected people and knowing that they wouldn't have aligned themselves. And I mean, my understanding is that Billy Asu waited a long time before he finally did agree. Um, so he took his time thinking about it. And I think that really tells us something too. So yeah, I've just, I've had people kind of question it at times who were saying, you know, what was her real intentions and the question around the recordings going to folkways and was that really appropriate and, and I think it was a different time. I think we need to understand that we don't know every conversation that happened. And I think you're right, we should also really respect that Mungo Martin and Billy Asu knew what they were doing and made that decision. So yeah, that's a great answer. I really like that, thank you. Yeah, I don't think that she would have gone to folkways behind their back. Like she had, like, as you say, Billy Asu Billy Sue was like the gatekeeper that led her to be able to meet with others, including Mungo. And uh, I believe it's eight years that she waited to speak with him. Like, that's a long time, you know? Um, and then he, you know, he invited her and he was in whole hog. He invited her up to his home and like was fully invested in the project. So, I think that we have to respect that, you know? Um, yeah, and like after spending that much time building a relationship of trust, she wouldn't, it would be really stupid of her to like sell it to, to folkways for some opportunistic reason, right? Because Billy Asu could very easily say, you're never talking to me and I'm gonna tell everyone else that you're never talking to them either. And like, yeah. So that that I I seriously doubt that happened because the recordings were released, as I say, between the late '60s and the mid '80s. So that that suggests a sustained relationship, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Do we have any other questions? If we don't, I'd like to thank. Michael very much before I pass uh, the microphone over to Jesse again. And also thank you, Genevieve, for popping in. I know uh, you had so much wonderful information again, and we really do appreciate all the extra info. Jesse, off to you. Sure, I'll just, um, Michael, unless you have any last words. Just thanks, and thanks for the conversation. This was really nice. Yeah, thank you so much for being here once again on behalf of the friends of the BC Archives, and thank you to everyone who tuned in.